So Paul is talking to the church in Colossians. And listen to what he says in verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. It is a journey. You don't find yourself in Christ and just camp out. Listen, God is constantly moving. He's a God of movement. He's a God of change. Amen. There's constant motion in reference to the kingdom of God. The, 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 the worst thing we can do is just get stagnant. We just find ourselves in a religious routine. Paul says, therefore, as you receive Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Okay, notice verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition according to elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. That's a mouthful. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you, and you have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. Wow. That's unbelievable. The NIV says... See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Amen. In other words, Paul is commanding the church, exhorting the church, let no one take you captive by the spirit of seduction the seduction of this age. Let no one imprison you in false assumptions or untrue conclusions. Let no one bottle you up in container-sized faith and vision. And let no one box you in to man-made boundaries and barriers. I'm talking to us individual, individually and also talking to us as a church, as a corporate body. Because we can get boxed in as a body of believers. Amen. We just figure out a way we're comfortable in doing church, and we just do that. And we wonder why that you know, every once in a while there's a move of God, but, but you know, there's just not much change. We, you know, we don't see a lot of this or that. We look at the book of Acts, and we think, man, that must have been really good back in the day. Friends, listen to me. <clears throat> He's still writing the book of Acts. And we should be a part of what he's declaring and testifying of and recording. Amen. There should be miracles in this house. There should be deliverances in this house. There should be great growth in this house. Why? Because he is king, he is God, and he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. I just need somebody to cooperate with me and go where I'm going. Amen. Now listen, Satan is okay. He is okay if you have embraced God, but never really experienced God. And there's a difference. And there's some of you here that you've embraced God. You believe in God. You know, he's, he's on your calendar. You have a little promise box. You got a little bumper sticker. You got a little cross. You know. Got a little, I love my, my church, you know, wristband. You've embraced God, but you've never experienced God really. He's never really rung your bell. He's never, he never pulled a rug under, out from underneath you and you found yourself totally relying on His grace and mercy. You don't know what it is to pray through a night season and see the hand of God move in a miraculous way and you walked away knowing there is, there is absolutely no way possible that that happened outside of God's intervention. An intimate relationship with Him that brings tears to your eyes and you wake up and he's there. He tucks you in at night and kisses you on the forehead. I'm talking about a living, breathing relationship with Christ. Not just embracing his truth, but experiencing his life in you and through you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Listen, Satan is okay. If you talk of faith, 
but you live in fear. He is okay if you come to church, but you've never really learned how to be the church. Amen. There's power in you. There's power in you. Amen. You know, in reality, God has called you, anointed you. He has given you a divine mandate to be salt and light. And so you come together in church just to be refreshed and renewed. You can go back out into the world, your world, your marketplace, your neighborhood, and do the work of the ministry. And then we come together on Sundays services to just rejoice about what God's doing and get filled back up to go out and empty ourselves out again. Amen. It's not that we just barely make it through the week to church because we've got to have enough, another fix so we can make it through another week so we can have another fix. That's not at all what God had in mind. We come together to celebrate the goodness of God and let the Holy Spirit fill us that we can go back and testify of the goodness and grace of God. And we're building the kingdom out there. We just come together on Sunday to celebrate what God is doing. Amen. How long has it been since you actually testified of Jesus? That you've actually had a soul winning conversation with someone? Well, I, I pray for my neighbor. Really? What, you get in your car and as you're passing by, oh God, bless, 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 bless. Yes. I've done my religious duties for the day. Amen. Friends, listen, it's more than that. Amen. I'm not getting anywhere very fast. This probably won't be as short as the first. <laughs> so if we are to be this glorious church without spot or wrinkle, you know, lay hands on the sick and they're recovering, bring a house of healing, being a place of miracles, then we must be willing to walk on water when the invitation is given, as we preached last Sunday. I just want to remind us all, the miracle's not in the boat. Never has been. Amen. That's your box. That's your comfort zone. That's where you feel safe. If you want to go down with your boat, that's your prerogative. But friends, I want to, I want to be where he, if he's in the boat, I'm in the boat. If he's on the water, I want to have the courage to step out of the boat and find out where he's at. He has no obligation to get my permission where he puts his feet or where he lays his head. My responsibility is find out what God is doing and where he is going and head that, as, head that direction as fast as I possibly can. Amen? I still believe that all things are possible to him that believes. Now last week I shared the verse from Proverbs 29 and 18 where there is no vision. We've all heard this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Let me just make this little insertion, kind of my interpretation, where there is no need to see. Where there is no need to see, the people perish. Listen, God has never ceased to reveal himself to those that are looking for him. They that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. You shall find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. He's not playing hide and seek with his church. You've just got to do what he's commanded. You've got to be a part of the process. Amen. And so where there's no vision, sometimes we just think, well, that's some kind of prophetic, and it, it, and it may be, to, but I believe it, it boils down to our simple everyday life where there is no need to see, where there's no need for me to catch a fresh glimpse of Jesus. I'm just doing my thing, and I'm happy to be where I'm at, the Bible says I'm perishing because fresh revelation brings fresh excitement, fresh passion, fresh fire to burn on the altar of our soul. The message paraphrases it like this. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to or when they fully embrace what God is revealing, they are most blessed. How many, you know, here, you, you pray for revelation. You, 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 that's a part of your prayer. God, open my eyes that I can see. You know, the Bible talks in Revelations about having an ear to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. Having an ear to hear. God give us an ear to hear 
what God is saying. He's never stopped speaking. We've just stopped listening. God, give us eyes to behold what you are revealing. Not that you ever stop revealing yourself to your church, but we've stopped looking because we're okay to come and kind of punch our religious time clock on Sunday, fulfill our religious responsibilities, and then go through our week and just do what we do and just survive the trip. I believe God wants us to do more than simply survive the trip. Amen. There's a miracle in your hands. There's a will of God that God has preordained for you. Your steps are order of the Lord. There is kingdom stuff that God has mandated, and your name is all over it. And it's not my response. I've got my own stuff to do. But you've got your stuff that you need to be doing for God. Amen? Okay, how many is doing your stuff for God? <laughs> okay, that's a good reason why I'm preaching this message. What are you doing for the kingdom? Well, if, you know, Pastor, just, if he was just a little better, a little shorter, a little slimmer, I think this church would grow. Really? Seriously? You're going to do that to me? <laughs> and all the above are probably true. But listen, it's not my responsibility to grow this church. It is our responsibility as light and salt, amen, being a channel that God can flow through, a vessel that he can fill, touching, ministering, loving, embracing Amen. New people sitting on your pew. Why? Because you have made a difference in their lives. That's a good preaching. Amen. Hey, Mom, this is good preaching. Amen. In other words, a need to see. A need to see God in, in a fresh way invokes a blessing from God and provision from God. Just as... God is not in the box. The miracle was not in the boat. So what is God saying to all of us today? It is time we begin to think, live and love outside the box. So what does that mean? What does that look like? What does that demand? Well, in contemporary terms, living outside the box is a fresh perspective. Is a fresh set of eyes. It's new paradigms. New ways to do things. <laughs> okay? A different way of thinking. You say, oh, pastor, you're going to lead us down this crazy path. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to find the path that God is making footprints in the sand and follow that path. One definition of outside the box is this. Idea generated or problem solving that is not constrained by self-imposed limits, self-imposed limits, or conventional barriers being free or breakthrough thinking that creates and explores non-logical and uncommon ways and solutions. Now how many, I'm just reading this and you're going, yes, yes, amen. That just fires you up and other people's going, We're all wired a little different. Listen, God's patient with us. Some's going to jump on this like ugly on ape. Others are going to like run from it like, you know, can't run fast enough from it. I, I want to remind us all that, you know, God outside the box, that's who he is. I mean, he stepped, he stepped out onto nothing and said, let there be and there was. That is illogical. That's uncommon. That's God. Hallelujah. I want a church that he's building, not that we are striving, striving to manipulate. I want a place, be a part of a kingdom that he is the head, and we are just following his instructions. Outside the box. It's a term that's thought to be derived from a famous puzzle created by an early 20th century British mathematician, Henry Ernest Dudney. He sounds like a mathematician, does he? Ernest, Henry Ernest Dudney. In which the challenge, this puzzle, the challenge is to interconnect nine dots in a three-by-three three grid by using four straight, how many ever played this game? By connecting four straight lines 
drawn without the pencil ever leaving the paper. Okay, let's focus. I hate puzzles. Okay, just I want you to stare at those dots. Just stare at them. Focus. Okay. Keep staring. I'm going to talk. Don't look, look at me. You s- keep your eyes on the dots. The only way to solve this puzzle is to extend the lines beyond the artificial boundary created by the nine dots. The puzzle only seems difficult because people commonly imagine a boundary, a perimeter around the edge of the dots. They look at that and say, okay, I've got to do this in that three by three grid. But the only way to solve that problem is to get outside the grid. To get outside of the preconceived artificial boundaries or barriers or perimeters that we have ourselves set in place. The heart of the matter is an unspecified barrier, an unspoken boundary is typically perceived as reality. Okay, let's go to the next slide. There you go. Now, if you want to know how that actually works outside the box, just talk to Michael Garrett that's in the sound booth because he is a genius at puzzles. I mean, his wife says, he puzzles me. I don't know what that means. To solve the problem, listen, to solve the problem, we must think outside the box. And I believe God is challenging us today. Extend yourselves beyond the artificial boundaries. Live beyond the unspecified barriers. In layman's terms, just just take a chance at coloring outside of the lines. After all, who drew the lines anyway? Amen. Amen. You know, you've heard, well, they may not approve of that. Who's they? Well, they drew those lines for a particular person. Who's they? Well, you know, they said that we can only do church like who? (laughs) Who's they? Now you say, well, you know, I, I know what he's doing. You know, he's, he's setting us up. He does, this, he does this to us. You know, he builds this foundation and he's all setting us up for the kill. You know, we're probably like next Sunday, we're all going to be like in holy blue jeans and like flip-flops. You know, we're going to think outside the box. You know, we're probably like, you know, going to grow to afro and, and you know, uh, I don't know, you know, maybe some like, uh, you know, surfboards on the walls and stuff like that, you know, like. And we're going to really like cool it up. That would be easy. That would be easy. That's easy stuff. What God is wanting to do in and through us is hard stuff. To change the way you live. Change the way you do business. I just think it's time to take the limits off of God, the limits off of ourselves, and just see what masterpiece that He can paint with our brush. And it may be outside the lines. And it may be a picture that you never, you never even conceived, perceived in your own heart, your own mind. So I want us to think about one that we love and adore that lived his whole life outside the box. And I, I'll just kind of wrap this up by talking about Jesus. I mean, he lived his whole life outside the box. We say, well, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a Christ follower. I'm a disciple. Really? Really? Okay, good. Then you won't mind following him where he's been, where he's going, where he's at. 
He lived his whole life outside of conventional thinking, outside of acceptable paradigms, outside of unspecific barriers or boundaries, or specified, I'm sorry. He was born of a virgin to an unsuspecting, unassuming young teenage girl. That is outside the box. <laughs> nobody before, nobody after has been born of a virgin. That's outside the box. Can I get a witness? I mean, do you know anybody that can make that claim? This creator that was there when everything was put into motion, who all things were created by him, through him, and for him, this creator that's outside of time and space, that has no beginning, has no end, he was raised by a carpenter. Go figure. This teenager was there in the synagogues teaching theologians. <laughs> That's outside the box. This simple, unassuming man from Galilee became a living, breathing miracle. And his name is Jesus. Then he walks our way and simply says, follow me. Walk in my steps. Do what I've done. Because in John 14, it talks about how from his own lips, greater things than this shall you do. Greater things than this, because I go to my Father which is in heaven. There's a man that he desires to release upon his people, his church. So what did he do? What made him such a crusader of living outside the box? Just one thing I just want to mention to you this morning. It's simply this. There's a lot of things. But I believe it fits and it's relevant for us today, especially in the fact that he was willing to touch the untouchable. I want you to look in your Bibles in Matthew. Turn to Matthew chapter 8. I want to read this scripture. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 1. The Bible says, when he, Jesus, came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. We just read through these scriptures and we think, yeah, that was a nice, neat little story. What a great Bible story we can teach our kids. Friends, this was... This was so outside of the box. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus' response, he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. Well, that's what Jesus should do. He's God. He's Savior. He's healer. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Mark 1, 40, and a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling before him. Luke 5, 12, same leper, and there came a man, listen to this, full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I will be clean. And he stretched out his hand and he touched him. Jesus stretched forth his hand and he touched this diseased, defiled, dying man. This contagious, infectious, hopeless and helpless man. Jesus touched him. Why is this outside the box? In Leviticus 13.45, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes can't be in style today. Where she'll wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! As a warning to those around him because of his infectious, contagious disease. And he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. Now listen. He is unclean, he shall live alone, and his dwelling shall be outside of the camp, away from society. 
Albert Barnes comments on this text. The leper was to carry about with him the usual signs of mourning for the dead. So he lived his life caring about the usual signs of mourning for the dead. A precursor to his own demise. Moaning, grieving, crying out. The usual signs of mourning for the dead. The leper was to carry with him. Became his DNA, became his personality, came, became what you heard and saw from him. Disease progresses slowly at first, deeply seated in the bones and joint, essentially undetected until spots begin to appear on the skin. And gradually these spots grow to cover the entire body. The man that came to Jesus, he was full of leprosy. They give the appearance of foul wounds, sores and festering as the body slowly wastes away in a ruinous heap. Parts of the body actually began falling off, rotting away, leading eventually to one's horrific, painful death. A leper can live up to 50 years in this indescribable misery as he watches himself rot away, bit by bit and piece by piece. A horrible, deplorable way to die. And yet... And yet Jesus, this undefiled, unblemished, unprotected man from Galilee, reached out his hand and embraced him. That's outside the box. That's putting your Christianity on the line. I shared this story before, but allow me to share it again for the sake of emphasis. A couple that moved from New York City to our fair state years ago was, was in our church. Had a good business, making a lot of money, involved in drugs. Pretty much stole everything from them, including through <clears throat> unclean needles. She contracted the HIV virus. Unbeknownst to her, she knew she had been sick, didn't know why, going to our church, gets diagnosed. She was diagnosed in the later stages of this HIV virus. Went to see her in the hospital. They placed her in the hospital. She was going down quick. Health was deteriorating, losing weight, gaunt. When I walked into her, to her hospital room, The first thing she asked me, she said, Pastor, will I ever be able to come back to church? You say, sure, with your head. But what does your heart say? We've got to protect ourselves. Can he protect himself? Unprotected. He reached out. The cry of the leper took his help. He laid his hands on this infectious, contagious man. Well, I'm, I'll just pray you from, I'll, I'll pray for you from here. You just stay at 10 paces and I'll just, and he could have. I mean, there is another group of lepers that came to Jesus and never got to him. He just said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. Never got to Jesus. But in this case, he had to be showing us something. That he touched the untouchable. He touched the leper. The religious fled from the leper. Jesus ran to him. If I'm not come to the healthy 
but the sick. I've not come to the whole, but the broken. This, this, is, this is who we've been called to minister to. And not necessarily the up and rising, but those that are down and out, those that have no hope, those that are on their, on their last leg, those that have, have, ap- that have nowhere to go, no, no place to turn to, no one to call out for. You read John 5 concerning Bethesda. That's what Bethesda was all about. Five porches that held within them the lame, the halt, the broken, the maimed, the blind, all just looking, praying for a miracle. You know, we live in a we live in a kind of a weird Christian day today that, you know, talks about, you know, you gotta be cool. If you're gonna really attract him, you gotta be cool. You know, I'm I, I'm more for compassion than coolness, I'll just be honest. Coolness won't take you so far. But a compassionate heart, amen. Come on now. That's the most powerful words in all the world. That loves you, cares about you in spite of who you are, where you're at, where you've been, and even where you're headed. A compassionate heart that reaches out unprotected and embraces you in your contagious need. And yet he was willing to touch the untouchable. To love those that seemed unlovable and reach those that for sure seemed unreachable. He was willing to live outside the box for the sake of the marginalized. Those that have been battered and beaten up and lay bleeding in the streets. We have them all around us, guys. You say, well, you know, we need to grow our church. And, and, and the first thoughts come to my, our minds, well, maybe if the church down the street will have some problems, we'll get some of their folk. That's a great way to build a kingdom. They're just swapping sheep. I know there's some legitimate moves. I'm not making fun. I'm just telling you the main bulk of our growth and our passion for growth has to be those that are lost. So I asked the question this morning in closing, you know, are we touching our lepers? You know, are we touching our lepers? We don't need this facility. It's not going to be a hospital for the hurting. I'm just telling you right now. Let's sell it to the boys club or the girls club or YMCA and let's just, let's just do the best we can in our homes because no need to go to all the expense and all the work and just revving our motors up and never sticking the thing in drive. That's all we're doing every Sunday. Just get all revved up and go eat a burger and go home and you know watch gun smoke. We do it every Sunday. God help us. I'm going to tell you something. Our kids need to see some miracles of deliverance, some miracles of salvation. It's still there. It's still for us. The blood has, has not lost its power. But there's not, as long as we, as we, as we hug onto the oars, we will never see the miracles. It's the willingness To embrace the invitation when it's given. And I believe these are the last days. And God is crying out, come. Time to step out of the boat. Get out of your box. And let me lead you down the narrow pathways where the hurting and the lost are at. I close with this. A man in our church when I was growing up. His name was Brother Thompson. I'm not sure he even knew his first name until I was an adult, just Brother Thompson. He was an uneducated man, a little short, unassuming. You'd walk right by him, not even noticing. Wasn't striking, you know, in any in any manner as far as his appearance. Ran a, ran a laundry mat in a local community. In a rough neighborhood in Lawton. But I can remember going on staff as, as an associate part time and getting a call from Brother Thompson several times, well, sometimes several times a week. And he'd say, 
He didn't know he was supposed to call me Brother Dacus because I was on the staff. I'd grown, I'd grown up as Craig. He'd say, Craig? Yes, Brother Thompson? He'd say, I got another one. You need, you need, to, you need to come by the come by the laundromat and we'll go see him. And so I'd get in my car and I'd, I'd, I'd go over to the laundromat and, and he'd get in the car or we'd walk. And he'd lead me down alleys and he'd lead me places that, that I'd be looking around thinking, this, this cannot be safe. I mean, it's a good thing it's broad daylight because this cannot be healthy for any of us. But he'd, ha- he'd, he'd take me to some little apartment you know, garage apartment in the backside of an alley, and there'd be a single mom in there, a couple kids, just barely had enough money to, you know, keep body and soul alive and intact, and they'd come to the laundromat, and he'd talk about Jesus and invite them to church, and he'd say, okay, we need to go talk to this family, we need to go talk to this person, and I don't know how many times he led me to some inconspicuous, out-of-the-way place. We'd talk to somebody about Jesus. He'd preach to them out of the Word. We'd pray for them before we left. And then he'd say, now get their address down. You pick them up on Sunday. I can tell you, Brother Thompson, he lived full and died empty. He left it all in the playing field. He was willing to touch the untouchable. And that old man that prayed me through the Holy Ghost, got right on top of me, wouldn't let me up. We're too confined. That is politically un- incorrect today. But he crawled right on top of me, breathed right in my face, and he loved garlic like the best of them, man. And he said, you're not getting up you get the Holy Ghost, son. I was like, <laughs> okay, okay, Jesus, quick. But that same man, he brought him in. He brought him in. We get to heaven. It's not the man that can preach the most eloquent sermon and stir up a crowd. It's those little Thompsons with fire in their belly and a heart as big as Dallas to reach out to someone in need to touch those that nobody else would touch and embrace, no, embrace those that no one even noticed. people around us every day that's invisible to us. I mean, have you ever felt invisible to somebody? It's not a good feeling. Jesus never missed one. He saw them all. So in Matthew, it talks about how they brought, and I close with this, they brought the lame, they brought the blind, the deaf, the dumb, cripple. It says they laid him at, at his feet and Jesus touched them and healed them all. I just believe we need to start touching the untouchables. Amen. Anybody on my page? You say, what's it going to look like? I don't know. Well, who's going to be sitting by me? Who cares? That's good preaching, brother, but you're not getting a part of the offering. I'm just telling you right now. I love you, Brian. Who cares? Amen. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we just commit this word. (laughs) We commit the direction that you're leading us. God into divine providence. Lord, we just commit these things into your hands, into our hearts. And we kneel before you as Jesus did in the garden. And we say, nevertheless, not our will, but yours be done, O God. God, do a work in us, through us. God, challenge us to get outside of our box. Oh, God. Time is short (laughs) and coming soon. We must work while it's yet day, for the night cometh when no man can work. And God, I pray that you will stir us with, with a fresh fire of God burning on the altar of our soul, oh Lord. Praise God.